beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, where would you run if you had someone after you who wanted to kill you? Can you think of any place that might be safe? Living in Canada, where the rule of law is well established, we might say, I'd run to the police. But what if you had unintentionally committed a crime and the police were looking for you? What if there are good grounds to believe that you would not get a fair trial? Where would you go? What would you do? Is there any place where you might be safe? This is a central point that our text deals with this morning. The Lord commands His people Israel to set up six cities of refuge. To understand how cities of refuge functioned, we need to know something about how justice was administered in ancient times. If someone murdered one of your close relatives, the family was responsible for hunting down that person and killing him. In the Bible, the family member responsible for killing a murderer was called the avenger of blood. It was his responsibility to enforce the death penalty for murder. Yet what happened if someone killed someone else unintentionally? What if men were chopping wood together and one man's axe head flew off and killed his friend? What if men were working together on building on a building or a wall and a mason accidentally dropped a stone and it fell and killed someone below? In such situations, the avenger of blood would still seek to avenge the blood of his close relative. Yet since the death was not premeditated, but accidental, the person responsible was allowed to flee to a city of refuge. If the death was judged to be an accidental death, the manslayer was allowed to live in that city of refuge. The laws about the cities of refuge teach us some fundamental things about God and about the value of human life. They teach us some foundational principles about how justice was to be administered in a situation where one person has killed another. They show us how God is just, how he demands payment for the shedding of blood. Yet they also reveal his mercy in making provision for those who killed someone accidentally. Yet these laws also teach us, also touch us on a deeper level. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us that murder involves much more than intentionally killing someone else. He made it clear that murder begins in the heart and that God regards envy, hatred, anger, and a desire of revenge as murder. According to our text, we would not qualify for a city, for sanctuary in a city of refuge. So how are we saved from the punishment that we deserve? Is there anywhere that we can find refuge and safety despite being guilty of grievous sin against God and our neighbor? I preach to you God's word under the following theme. In his great mercy, the Lord provides cities of refuge for his people. We'll consider the purpose of the cities of refuge, the fulfillment of this law in Christ, and the enduring lessons for us as church today. Our text begins with the Lord giving the Israelites a command to share their inheritance with the Levites. While the other tribes were to be given their own inheritance, the Levites would not receive a specific area as their tribal portion. Instead, they were assigned 48 cities scattered among the land, given to the other tribes. Around these towns, the Levites were given pasture lands for their livestock. In comparison with the other tribes, this may have seemed like a poor provision for the Levites. 
who had faithfully ministered at the tabernacle during the, wander, during the wilderness wanderings. If you were a Levite, you might think that you were getting less than what you deserved. Yet their circumstances were the result of what their forefather, Levi, had done. When Jacob settled at Shechem, his daughter Dinah was raped by the ruler's son. Simeon and Levi took matters into their own hands. And they said that the ruler's son would only be allowed to marry Dinah if all the men of Shechem were circumcised. Yet when the men of Shechem complied, they massacred all the inhabitants of this town in order to get revenge. Before he died, Jacob pronounced a curse on Simeon and Levi for their anger and their violence. He said, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Because of the faithfulness of the Levites, the Lord had set them aside to minister at the tabernacle. When they settled in Israel, the Lord still gave them a specific role among his people. They took turns ministering at the tabernacle and later the temple. Yet they were also assigned a new task of helping the people to know and understand God's law. God turned Jacob's curse into a blessing for his covenant people. The Levites lived in various cities throughout the land, ministering to his people. From among the 48 cities set aside as their inheritance, God designated six cities as cities of refuge. There were to be three on the east side of the Jordan and three on the west. They were to be spaced throughout the land so that anyone who unintentionally killed his neighbor would have easy access to one of these cities. They're called cities of refuge, for they served as a refuge from the avenger of blood. When a person sought sanctuary in a city of refuge, he was not allowed to be killed until he had stood for judgment before the congregation. To understand how the cities of refuge functioned, we need to know more about how justice functioned in Israel. In ancient times, they didn't have police officers or courts or prisons. If someone killed another person, that person's family was responsible for hunting him down and killing him. In our text, this person is called the Avenger of blood. He was the person's closest male relative. He was God's appointed representative to avenge the blood of a close relative who was murdered. It's important to understand the role of the avenger of blood. The Hebrew word used for the avenger is the word goel. In Israel, a goel was a kinsman redeemer. It was his responsibility to buy a family member out of slavery brought on by poverty or to buy property to keep it from being passed out of the family. He was responsible for marrying the wife of a dead relative to raise up a son to carry on this man's name in Israel. Just think of the story of Ruth. Our text shows that he was also responsible for avenging the murder of a close relative. Yet there were situations where someone was not murdered, but rather killed accidentally. Our text makes a distinction between murder and manslaughter. If a person killed someone else, he could flee to a city of refuge. Justice was administered by the elders in the city gate. They heard and judged on the matters presented to them. If the judges determined that someone was guilty of murder, he was handed over to the avenger of blood to be put to death. But if he had killed someone unintentionally, he was allowed to live in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. How were judges to determine if someone was guilty of murder or manslaughter? Our text lists four criteria to distinguish between a murderer who was to be killed, and a manslaughter, a manslayer who was to receive refuge. 
A person was to be given refuge if he killed without intent. That is, accidentally or unintentionally. He was given refuge if he did not lie in wait seeking to kill the murdered person. He was given refuge if he was not acting out of hatred or enmity. Finally, he was also to be given refuge if he did not strike the murdered person with a lethal weapon. If he did strike him with an iron object or a stone or wooden tool in his hand, it was to be assumed that he intended to harm him and that he was thus guilty of murder. Our text reveals God's justice. Anyone guilty of murder was to be put to death. We need to understand why God takes murder so seriously and why the shedding of blood requires atonement. It's made clear from Genesis 4, which tells the story of Cain murdering his brother Abel. The Lord confronts Cain with his sin, saying, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Cain is cursed from the ground. God says it will no longer yield its fruit to him. Instead of being a farmer who earned his living from the ground, Cain is told that because he shed Abel's blood, he would be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. There's a second passage in Genesis that teaches us about the ultimate value of human life. In Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, we're told, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. Whoever sheds, sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Here we see that human life belongs to God. If one person takes the life of another, payment for this sin must be made. Such payment can only be made by the death of the murderer. In our society, many shudder at the thought of capital punishment. And in some ways, that makes sense. Because history shows that there are many in North America, especially black men, who have been put to death unjustly. God's law required irrefutable evidence that someone was guilty of murder. No one was allowed to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. As Christians, we should be supportive of capital punishment if administered in the proper fashion. For Romans 13 teaches that God has not given the government the sword in vain but that the government is the servant of God, an avenger to carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Throughout the ancient Near East, it was customary for a murderer to be able to ransom his life through the payment of money. Yet the Lord explicitly forbade this. He said, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. Similarly, the Lord also forbade the payment of a ransom to allow someone freedom from living in the city of refuge prior to the death of the high priest. The killing of another human could only be paid for with blood. The cities of refuge did not negate the principle that death was necessary to atone for another's death. Instead, they upheld that principle. Verse 33 of our text makes it clear that the shedding of blood pollutes the land. The land would remain defiled unless the blood was atoned for. Verse 34 reminds God's people not to defile the land in which they lived. For the Lord dwelt in the midst of them, polluting the land with blood, would make it unfit for divine habitation. We know from Israel's history that one of the reasons why God's people went into exile was because of the innocent blood that especially King Manasseh shed in the land. 
Our text also reveals God's mercy. In allowing someone to escape a death sentence if they were judged guilty of manslaughter rather than murder. Yet in such situations, they still bore a set punishment. They were required to live in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. They were not allowed to depart from the city during that time. Any time they ventured out of the city of refuge, it was the avenger of blood's responsibility to put them to death. They had shed blood. That blood needed to be atoned for. For the manslayer, it was the death of the high priest that atoned for the unintentional shedding of blood. I want you to note, beloved, the irony of the fact that the cities of refuge were cities belonging to the Levites. It was an act of murder that had caused God to curse their father, Levi. If God had done to Levi as he mandated in our text, there would have been no Levites at all. Every time the Levites witnessed a trial that resulted in the death of a murderer or the exile of the manslayer, they were reminded of the grace they had received. When they were required to show hospitality to a manslayer who lived among them, they had opportunity to show him mercy as God had first shown it to them. This brings us to our second point, and it will see the fulfillment of this law in Christ. The laws about the cities of refuge applied to God's people Israel during the time they lived in the promised land. Like many of the Old Testament laws, they do not directly apply to our lives today anymore. But there are clear things that we can learn from these laws. They teach us about the high value of human life. And how the Lord abhors violence and the shedding of blood. As human beings, we understand how horrible it is when someone is murdered. Their life is cut off. Their family is left grief-stricken. We recognize that murder requires a just punishment. That's even more true of God, the Creator, of human life. Yet God's standards are much higher than ours. We see this in our reading from Matthew 5. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus shows that God also hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, and a desire for revenge. Jesus shows that God holds us to a high standard. And beloved, none of us can live up to that standard. While it's unlikely that we'll ever be charged with murder, we are guilty of getting frustrated and getting angry with those around us. At times we say and we do hurtful things. If we've suffered deeply at the hands of another, we may hate him or her. We may want revenge for that, what that person has done. God knows what lives inside of us. According to his law, we deserve condemnation. Strictly speaking, if we were to apply the legislation about the cities of refuge to our lives, there would be no city of refuge available to us. We deserve to be handed over to the avenger of blood, to be executed. According to Numbers 35, no ransom can deliver us, no payment of silver or gold can save us. According to the law, There is no hope for us. Yeah, beloved, we need to ask the question whether our sins of envy, anger, hatred, and a desire for revenge are always premeditated, are always 
deliberate sins. Think about how the Lord Jesus was crucified. It was out of envy that the Jewish leaders delivered him up to be crucified. Their hearts were blinded by their hatred and their anger. If judged by a human court, we would judge they were guilty of murder. Stephen says as much in Acts 7.52. And yet Jesus prayed for those who crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Their malice and hatred were mixed with blindness and ignorance, for they did not recognize Jesus as the Lord of glory. Think about the Apostle Paul. On the one hand, his sin in persecuting the church of God was deliberate. Acts 9 says that Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest asking for letters to round up the Christians in Damascus. After his conversion, Paul writes to Timothy about how formerly he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He says, But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. The point is simple. And many of our sins are done out of blindness or ignorance or out of the weakness of our human flesh. There is forgiveness available for such sins as long as we don't defiantly continue in them. When we come to the Lord with humble and contrite hearts, confessing our sins and seeking His grace, He will forgive us. Hebrews 5.2 makes mention of how the high priest can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. God deals patiently with us because he knows our sinful nature. It's why he sent Jesus as a sin offering on our behalf. Beloved, we live in the dispensation of grace. The provision of the gospel far exceeds the mercy available under the law. In the gospel, the heavenly avenger has become our Redeemer. You remember how in Numbers 35, the avenger of blood is the Goel, the kinsman Redeemer? Well, that's exactly who Jesus Christ is. In Jesus Christ, God took upon himself human flesh, becoming our kinsman. Do you know why? Jesus explains, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. How did God accomplish such a great salvation for us? Well, we deserve Jesus Christ to be the avenger of blood who judges us and who executes us. But instead, Jesus was judged. He was executed in our place. God's justice requires that a murdered person's blood be atoned for. Shed blood pollutes the land. It cries out for vengeance. But God's vengeance has been satisfied. For Jesus Christ came as our high priest. He offered his blood on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In a way, we could say that Jesus has become our city of refuge. The writer of Hebrews speaks in chapter 6 about how we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast the hope set before us. 
What is this hope? Hope for a reconciled relationship with God through the atoning work of Christ. Thus we put our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of the laws about the cities of refuge. It is to him and to him alone that we are to flee when we've sinned, when we deserve to come under God's condemnation. Brings us to our final point, and we'll consider the enduring lessons for the church today. We've spoken about the fact that there's only one solution to the punishment that we deserve for our sins. Jesus is our refuge when we have sinned, when we've broken communion with God. We may flee to him to find mercy and grace in our time of need. Yet how are we to receive that mercy and grace? Practically speaking, where can we flee when our life is upended, when we're feeling guilty and ashamed, when we're under the attack of sin and Satan? Where can we as 21st century Christians find refuge? There's a simple answer to that question. Today it is our churches that need to be cities of refuge, places of grace where those who are lost and hurting can experience the same mercy we have received. The church is a community of forgiven sinners and should therefore provide a warm welcome for all who come to seek refuge from their sins. Beloved, I want to qualify what I'm saying so that there is no misunderstanding. The church should not shelter those guilty of crimes from the punishment that they deserve at the hands of the state. The government is God's lawfully appointed representative to punish evildoers. If someone is guilty of murder or of domestic violence or of child abuse, the police and the courts must play a role in investigating and prosecuting their crimes. It's wrong for a church to shove those kind of things under the carpet or to think that it has the authority or the competence to deal with criminal matters. Yet as church community, we're a community of forgiven sinners who need to be a community of forgiving people. God has shown us incredible grace by forgiving our sins through the blood of Christ. And so we need to learn to show grace to our brothers and sisters when they have sinned. That can be incredibly difficult it's much easier to make judgments about someone than to forgive them. It's especially the case when a brother or sister has sinned against us, when they've hurt us deeply. What we need to understand is that God uses people to communicate the riches of his grace. We would not understand what it means for God to be our loving father if we'd never experienced the love of our earthly parents. It's difficult to understand forgiveness unless we've experienced it in our interpersonal relationships. We know that when God forgives our sins, he wipes the slate clean. He no longer holds them against us. We understand what that means when we've hurt someone. And yet that person is willing to still be our friend and continue in a close relationship with us. As church community, we need to strive to be a place of refuge for all those who are willing to confess their sins and repent of them. We often live messy lives, beloved. There are particular sins that each one of us struggle with. Often our sins cause struggles in our relationships 
They get in the way of intimacy in our marriages. They damage relationships in our families and in the church community. Our sins may cause us guilt and shame, but they also have an impact on others around us. They often cause hurt, frustration, anger, hatred, at times even a desire for revenge. It's for this reason that Jesus taught us the importance of reconciling damaged relationships. He said, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God is not pleased to receive our worship. If we're not willing to be reconciled, to our brother or sister in Christ. God will not forgive us our sins if we're not willing to forgive those who have sinned against us. As church, we will not be a place of refuge, a haven of rest, if we're not living in love and a unity together. And so we see our desperate need For our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He is the only sure refuge for lost and wandering souls. His death is a big enough sacrifice to pay for any and all of our sins. His grace is wide and deep enough to welcome us in, to wash us clean, to keep us safe during our earthly pilgrimage. It's only through His grace that He enables us to show grace to those around us. Thus, it's only when Christ stands in the center that His church can function as a place of refuge for all those who are guilty and ashamed, lost and hurting. May we, as Redeemer Church, Be a place of refuge for all who seek shelter due to sin and its effects. Amen. In response to the gospel message, let's rise and sing. Psalm 118, stanzas 2, 4, and 8.